Uh, hi everybody, my name is Jamie Webb. I'm the festival manager at Milwaukee Film and a part of the programming committee for this year's inaugural FilmX. Uh, while I live and work in the US, I will be attending this year's conference from my homeland, uh, Scotland. So any of the European based contingent looking for an early morning chat, feel free. I'm on your time zone. So feel free to hit me up on Slack. Uh, speaking of Slack, if you haven't yet signed up, uh, you can do so at the conference platform, go to the extras tab uh, and you'll, you'll see the Slack um, setting up going there. Um, so first of all, I want to thank all of the FFA FilmX sponsors, especially National Endowment for the Arts uh, and today's day sponsor, Filmocracy. All of our sponsors uh, have, have availability in uh, virtual vendor rooms. So if you head over to the conference platform and the sponsor tab, um, you'll be able to visit with them. Um, maybe it's a vendor you know, maybe it's a potential new vendor. Um, go and say hi to all of our lovely sponsors. Um, and obviously we also want to give a big thank you to all of the FilmX volunteers. Uh, as we all know, they are the true heroes. Um, just, a, just a little bit from me, um, planning this conference in such a weird year and getting to regularly meet with the FFA staff and the entire programming committee has been uh, truly a beacon of light, laughter, uh, hope. Um, and I know we all hope that FilmX can be that same beacon um, of light, hope, laughter um, for all of you as we come through 2020 and into 2021. Um, with all of that said, um, I'm going to pass you along to today's host um, for the first operations track panel. This is Access Reframed, Making Media Accessible, presented with full spectrum features. Uh, and Jason, take it away. Thank you very much, Jamie. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Matsumoto, and I'm going to be your host for this conversation. I am the co-founder and director of operations at Full Spectrum Features. Uh, we are a Chicago-based 501c3 committed to driving equity into the independent film industry. Um, I'm going to, you know, this, this conversation is very special to me. Um, it's housed under the operations section of the tracks. Um, but a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is both kind of like um, what is mandated, what's required for um, bridging accessibility and inclusion. And um, <clears throat> kind of along with that also, you know, what is the cultural and the, the social impact to um, changing people's minds around this, like kind of the hearts and minds, right? So as part of that, we wanted to model um, something called an audio description. So I'm gonna do mine right now. And both the panelists will do this as well. Um, so I identify as a Japanese American and use he, him pronouns. I am five uh, foot three inches tall, appear East Asian, and have long black hair currently tied into a bun. Um, <clears throat> behind me in my room is um, a doorway that kind of frames my head and um, a few pictures in the background. One is pink and one is um, a small white picture. So on behalf of Full Spectrum, um, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today. And I now want to turn to introduce um, our two presenters. Uh, first off, we have Emily Batix, who is an associate director at the Paul K. Longmore Institute on Disability at San Francisco State University. Uh, founded in 1996 by historians and scholar activist Paul Longmore, the Longmore Institute uses public education and community events to teach disabled and non-disabled people alike how disability can enrich our world. Emily uh, is a, um, has a PhD focused on disability studies and is the co-director of Superfest Disability Film Festival. Uh, Thomas Reed is um, the host of the podcast called Read My Mind Radio. He is an audio describer, advocate, and voice actor. In 2004, while working, at, while working as an IT developer, Thomas lost his sight as a result of cancer. Disturbed by the lack of accessibility, he helped um, launch a local advocacy organization and later pursued dormant ideas in audio production in order to help promote topics pertaining to vision loss. Uh, he's also pursuing a career as a voice actor. So I'd like to welcome both of them, both Emily and Thomas, and I'm gonna turn it over to Emily for, for today's presentation. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Jason. And thank you, Sophia, as well, for being our tech support and helper today and super organized. Um, it is a pleasure to get to share um, a little bit about what we do at Superfest with you all. Um, I guess I'd start by talking about how messy access work is. Um, and that's a, sort of a disclaimer because we have such a small amount of time and we're, we're gonna cover just a little teaser of some of the, the work that goes into it. Um, I have an image on the slide right now that's uh, somebody with a, a paintbrush and a pencil and their hands are just covered in paint. And uh, this comes with the caveat of like the fact that I used to be just an academic who loved the concept of universal design, which is um, the idea that you can sort of build an environment so that anybody, any body, any person's uh, needs, accommodations, whatever, could just uh, not have to be an issue. You just would be able to enter a space and everyone will have their needs met. It's a beautiful, beautiful concept, um, utopian idea. And, and then uh, sort of leaving academia and, and stepping into my current role where I had to uh, had the opportunity to run this disability film festival in addition to many other sort of on the ground projects. Um, I realized that while that um, uh, idea of universal design is really beautiful to aspire to, it also really isn't honest about the, the messiness of this work. There are always going to be sort of things where access for one group um, uh, creates uh, challenges for another group. There's going to be competing accommodations. It's just going to be, you know, there's no manual for this stuff. You've just got to let it be messy. And, uh, and yet in that hardness, in that uh, messiness, that's also where access becomes really creative and an opportunity to, to see your projects and your films in a new way. And, and some really beautiful stuff can happen. So that's just kind of starting off with while I'm going to give some bullet points on like how to think about access, it's much messier than, than I'm going to possibly cover for. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the people I first learned from when I was starting to dive into to doing this, this sort of work was somebody named Joshua Mealy. And this was, we, we gathered a bunch of people together and sort of learned from them about their experiences um, accessing art institutions and just heard so many stories of how, um, how exclusionary uh, art programming museums and film festivals can be. And, uh, and they said that one of the reasons why is even sometimes when they're thinking about compliance, they're thinking about it in such a basic, minimal way. So this uh, slide has an image of Joshua, who is a white man in, um, uh, in his 40s in this photo. He has some scarring on his face and is holding a guide cane and wears a really bright purple shirt. Oh, I forgot to do my own audio description. My own audio description is that I am a woman, a white woman, uh, cisgendered in my 30s, and I'm, I've got a blue wall behind me. My brown curly hair is up, and I've got some fun dangly earrings because in Zoom times, dangly earrings are all we can do to accessorize. So um, back to with Joshua. Joshua is the principal accessibility researcher at Amazon. And he shared this quote with me. He said, if you think access is gonna happen by following code compliance, it's like saying that the best food you can eat comes from precisely following a recipe. Everyone knows that in reality, you get the best stuff when you break out from the cookbooks, taste, adjust to create a dish that thinks outside the box. So that kind of sets up the presentation today. I'm gonna give some of the sort of basic ideas and things you should be thinking about for bringing better access to film festivals. And then Thomas is going to come and give some really great examples of like, what does it look like when you dive into thinking about um, going beyond compliance to make this uh, much more artistic, uh, exciting access work. Next slide, please. So why bring access to film programs? So we've got the carrot and the stick. I actually have an image on the screen of a carrot and a stick. So these are the two motivations. Now, I, of course, prefer to try and get people excited with the carrot. So the first point with the carrot is that access brings benefits to all. So in addition to the fact that we should be doing this first and foremost for people with disabilities, one in four people in this country now have a disability. Uh, not to mention we're living in a time of COVID where the amount of disabilities is rapidly increasing every day as people um, uh, who are surviving with COVID just have so many uh, lingering symptoms. But on top of it, um, a lot of the things that we build in for access end up bringing benefits for 
non-disabled people as well. Uh, especially what I love to try and get film professionals to think about is that some of your donors are often um, elderly and they might not think of themselves as having a disability, but they might greatly benefit from some of the features that we bring thinking about a more accessible film festival. Having them in your audience longer is obviously a good thing. Um, but in addition to, to that, um, bringing disabled patrons in can increase your audience and help you fulfill your mission. So many of our, our, our missions as film festivals are to, to bring people together and, and promote community and get these stories out there. And when the disabled population is such a huge part of this country that has been left out of film festivals, this is such a great opportunity to suddenly expand your audience. We've seen that in COVID um, because film festivals have had to go online. Those have actually brought a lot of access for people. People who can't get out of bed and are able to participate in film festivals for the very first time in their life and are now part of those conversations and are able to share about the amazing films they've seen and, and participate in this important cultural um, tradition. So that's the carrot exciting things, but then there is the stick, which is that this July, we celebrated 30 years after the Americans with Disabilities Act. So it is the law that we should be bringing access to our film festivals. And so if you aren't thinking about this stuff at all, now is the opportunity to get on board. Next slide, please. So what does compliance look like? It's kind of hard to talk about right now because we have two models of what it looks like. There's the film festivals that we all remember so well and miss of being together in a packed uh, house. And then there's um, film festivals during the pandemic. Um, I'm going to, you know, really optimistically here share a little bit about uh, pre-pandemic film festivals in hopes that we'll be heading back that way again soon someday. Um, so we offer at Superfest, we offer, offer flexible seating options. That means that a wheelchair rider can come and they don't just have the one of two seats available to sit at. There's various options of seating in the auditoriums. We typically go with venues that are either flat seating or flat seating and then stadium seating. Um, so we give you know multiple places where we'll just remove chairs from the seating so that wheelchair riders can come. And if they have a vision impairment, they can be right up in front but if they don't have a vision impairment and they have a neck problem that makes it hard to stare up, they can be further back in the audience. Uh, it allows a wheelchair rider to come with three friends who are seated and find a place where they can all be together. Um, we think about seating for fat patrons. So for example, we often have bench seating that doesn't, doesn't presume that everybody will fit in the size of chairs that we have. Um, and we also similarly uh, at some of our screenings will put out bean bags and encourage people to be able to lie down if that's what their body needs. Um, we have uh, American Sign Language and then we make sure to reserve seating in that area so that our deaf patrons can be close enough to see the interpreting and have dialogue with the interpreter, but also find each other um, as deaf community. Um, we have low vision seating for people with vision impairments to be able to sit close to the screens. And then we have chemical sensitivity seating. So we tell all of our audiences, please do not um, come with any scented products. Uh, we work with our venues to think about scented products, but even still there are people who come um, with scents. So it is much more comfortable for our guests who have um, multiple chemical sensitivity to know that they can come and have some seating that is completely removed from the rest of the audience where they'd be seated only with other people who are, you know, heightened awareness of chemical sensitivity. Ideally, this space is like near a window or an open area. So our film festival also offers American Sign Language and live captioning during all programs, um, in addition to open captioning of all of our films. We have audio description, which Thomas is going to share much more about, but this is a verbal track that's either built into the films or provided live audio description via headsets so that a blind or vision impaired person has access to information about any visual cues that are happening on a screen. Um, we think about trigger warnings, so that's um, uh, that can be kind of two types of trigger warnings. One, the, the one that has much more conversation about sort of emotional content. Um, you know, if suicide or uh, sexual assault is going to come up, letting people 
uh, know in advance, making sure our website is really thorough with our descriptions. Um, but then also, um, uh, it comes in the form of like we received a film to the festival this year that had a, a very brief film with a ton of flashing lights. So we had two options either to um, offer a trigger warning in advance that people with various vision impairments, epilepsy, would either want to sit that film entirely out, or in this case, we were able to reach out to the filmmaker and say, is it possible we can accept a version of the film that just doesn't have those 30 seconds? Unfortunately, they were up for doing that. Um, we offer a quiet room in the venue, which is a place where somebody who has autism or sensory overload or, or various, many, many disabilities where you would just want to get away from that large crowd and have a moment to yourself. Um, we, we make sure people know that that space is available to them. And then we have an access go-to person. So one of the things that people complain so much about is that they say, you know, they call up with questions about film festivals and they need information and they just have no one to go to. And so they get maybe, you know, different answers every time they call and just how frustrating this can be. So we make sure that all of the publicity materials we send out have a lot of information about like, if you have anything that we haven't covered on the list of information we give about access, you know, we get that there might be other things we're not even thinking about every year at Superfest, we're adding something new that we haven't done. And so um, uh, we make sure they have a contact to, to, to reach out to. Now, during a pandemic, uh, it's a really different situation, obviously, and yet we found that there's a whole lot of opportunities for bringing access that, that is much easier than usual. You, you don't have to think about some of the, the logistics of a physical space that can be more challenging. So for example, uh, when we offer audio description, um, while audio description, we've typically op offered it open audio description so that anyone um, can just experience the festival. We, uh, we found that some people with sensory disabilities find that it's like too much verbal information to take in. And so they'd rather have the ability to opt out of the audio description. In, in pre-pandemic times, this meant a constant sort of, um, playing around with like, oh, we'll have this screening open audio description and we'll have a separate screening room that's closed and then we'll switch them for the next screening. Um, in, in pandemic situations, it's just two Zoom links, which can make it a lot more, you know, access becomes the choose your own adventure experience. Um, we just, as we're demonstrating on this, uh, we've turned off chat so that there will only be a few chats offered. Um, that makes it easier for people with screen readers to take in. Uh, it, your screen reader can want to talk at you every time something comes in the chat, so it can be really overwhelming. We spotlight the ASL interpreter, as you can see right now. Um, and then live cart. A lot of people are very excited about the, auto, the huge progress that we've seen in the last year of automatic captioning. It is very exciting because at a bare minimum, now a lot of programs that didn't have any form of access can now have some access, but it is not the same as having a live captioner where you can send them uh, names like mine, Emily Badix shows up as Emily Basic, which is not that fun uh, on, on automatic captions. So thinking through these sorts of access features are, um, and again, I'm going fast and I'm just giving a lot of teasers, but um, we're going to dive in further and we'll have some time in Q&A to, to follow up. I want to pass it now to Thomas and let him provide you know, a much richer example of like, what does it mean to go beyond compliance if we take one specific item of the list I've covered and, and just talk about audio description for the blind and vision impaired. Thank you, Thomas. Cool, thank you. You can hear me okay? Emily? Yes, sounds okay, great. Great, excellent. So I guess I'll start with my, um, my description. I'm currently seated in my home office here in the Poconos, Northeast Pennsylvania which is about 90 minutes west of the place I always call home, and that's the Bronx, New York. Always have to shout that out. Um, I am an African-American man with a freshly shaved brown bald head and a goatee. I'm wearing dark shades and a gray sweater. My pronouns are he and him. Um, Jason already told you I produce a podcast called Read My Mind Radio. And I think more important for this is, is my work around audio description, which is um, as a narrator, a consultant, and most importantly, as a consumer. What I want to do today is to share a few stories from my own experience with audio description. And within each, I think I can highlight some of what I think makes up good and bad audio description. So let me start with this 
early recollection from 2004, which was soon after losing my sight. Um, Sophia, we could start that first one, please, this first slide. So I was seated on the couch in my family room and I had my remote control in my hand and I sat down, right? And I was sitting there, all I wanted to do was to sink in. That's both into the comfort of my couch and some sort of content on the screen. I have to say that it feels sort of ignorant on my part, but until this specific day in 2004, I don't recall ever considering how the movie experience would be different as a blind person. I quickly realized as the movie began and I had no idea what was happening, that good audio description is all about access. That day, I didn't know that almost 20 years prior, a blind woman and her sighted husband were pioneering audio description in the live theater space. They planted a seed by creating described performances and even more importantly, training others to do the same. That's provide information about what's taking place on screen or stage when there's no dialogue. What you're listening to is sort of what I experienced that day on the couch. While it's not the same film, similarly, this one begins with absolutely no dialogue. HBO made a conscious decision to not make their content accessible. And I say that because it's based on all the inquiries that I made to them requesting it. Anyway, in the early days of becoming blind, I felt like escaping into movies would no longer be an option for me. In 2007, about three years after this experience, for the first time since losing my sight, my wife and I actually ventured out for one of our favorite dates. We went to the movies. Now, I didn't know what was about to happen. Early in our relationship, the movies were our thing. We would spend Saturday afternoons occasionally going from one theater to another theater in a multiplex, allegedly. And you all know you did the same thing. Unbeknownst to me, this would be our first experience with audio description in the movie theater. Finally, see, a theater near my home actually was offering the service. So now I'm gonna skip through some of the challenge that we experienced getting the equipment and actually getting it to work. But as we sat there watching this beautiful romantic film, I was able to sink in. In fact, we were able to sink in. So now you notice you still haven't heard any dialogue and we're gonna go to the next slide, please. McLean enters the frosty interior of a cooling tower, gun at the ready. Rand peers up from below through the ice-covered pipes. You might want to start thinking about what you want on your headstone, Anson. Rand fires and bounds with extraordinary agility up the tower, so fast that McLean can't aim properly. Christ. Damn hamster! There you go. Get still, spider boy! Rand runs up walls and swings until he's just beneath McLean. That's right! McLean kicks away his gun. Rand leaps up and they fight face to face. Kicked and punched, McLean falls and dangles from a wire. Rand dives down and kicks him in the chest. McLean lands heavily, just above some spinning machinery. Rand darts away, and McLean tries to reach the dropped pistol. Rand drops down and also sees the pistol. Dangling just above the whirling machine, he fires up at McLean. Taking cover, McLean spots a tap with a sign, caution, liquid nitrogen. He kicks the tap, and Rand is frozen by a super-chilled blast. He drops and is chopped to pieces by the machinery. Thomas leads his team with Farrell and Lucy out to the truck. Okay, maybe it wasn't romantic, but we actually did really enjoy action films together. So one thing I want to point out about this one is that you see how the description actually worked with the dialogue in the scene. So when they were talking about the quickness and the agility running up the stairs, in the dialogue, it included that reference to a hamster and a reference to a spider boy or something. And that really together helps paint that picture for me. It made me lean over to my wife and ask her, hey, did that look as good as it sounded? She told me to shut up, but I'm kidding. So she was really, really happy about the experience because this was the first time we had that experience like we used to. Good audio description creates connections. 
So if you think of the water cooler moments, right? It allows blind and low vision members, low vision people to have, a, be a part of the conversation. Good AD or audio description is respectful. And what I mean by that is that it doesn't try to explain the plot. It doesn't over describe a movie. So for example, if a phone rings, I hear it. I don't need you to tell me that, right? You don't censor. If it's important enough to be in the film, then it should be included in the description. And that includes things like violence, nudity, sex. It's okay for the audio description to match the rating of the film. Good AD means good audio. So I shouldn't have to be raising or lowering the volume to hear or not hear the describer. It should just work, right? Um, good audio description should never step on the dialogue. Good audio description actually is creative, it's artistic. Most of the really creative AD that I hear about or I experience comes around in the live theater space. And more than often, it's actually from within the disability community. So here's an example of it. Now, I'm not a big sports fan, but I really like sports documentaries. Last Dance, which is a documentary about Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls, was released on ESPN. And unfortunately, it didn't have audio description. However, when it came to Netflix, it did. The team over at IDC really saw it as an opportunity to be more creative with their standard uh, audio description. So, Sophia? The Bulls gather around Scotty on the floor. When Pippen didn't respond to that abuse, there's nothing they could do to beat us in. Scotty chews his gum. His teammates help him up. Scotty was unshakable. Didn't even want a Band-Aid. When we saw that, it was over. You know, it was just like, okay, it's a foul. Uh, let's go ahead and finish kicking their ass and, you know. And put them out of their misery. Short rebound. He has Pippen. Scotty slams a two-handed fast break dunk. Chicago Bulls about to put the Pistons away in four. Michael finishes a one-handed soaring dunk. Off to court. And Chuck is now clearing the bench. Still a genuine draft player of the game. Scotty Pippen of the Chicago Bulls. We were tasting victory over a team that just kicked your butt for the last three or four years. I mean, it, the gratification, you, you truly cannot put it into words. On the bench, Michael and Scotty dap. It is all over. See that? So the narrative there was moving really subtly, moving between the tones used for a narrator, which is really just to provide that information maybe occasionally emoting a little more than usual, but he also stepped into the voice of a sports announcer on a few occasions when the action actually called for it. At its core, AD is about providing access to the visuals. Sighted viewers often glean information about a film silently. This can include things about plot, setting, characters, right? Including the, their color, race, ethnicity, and other visual identifiers. Information that could be relevant to their interpretation of the story. Blind viewers should have access to that information. Right now, AD guidelines say that information about race or color should be provided when it's important to the plot. I'm here to tell you this is America and race is always important. It's important for that young blind child to know that there are people on that screen who either look like her or just as importantly, they don't. She should know that a show or film is either diverse or is lacking in diversity. Now what the consumer does with that information similar to a sighted person, that's their business. Unfortunately, the rules were written by those with the option of being colorblind. That is the benefit of thinking that race only matters when specifically noted in the plot. As we know, being colorblind as it applies to race never really worked out. Bad audio description assumes that white is the default. And literally, by not including color and other indicative information, erases people of color from the screen after we finally made it there. Good audio description is sensitive to language, paying attention to how we describe people and places. It's culturally competent. 
So for example, notice that dap between Jordan and Pippen. Good AD doesn't draw you away from the film. This can include the voice of the narrator. So Marvel's Black Panther, as we can recall, was more of a cultural moment than it was a movie for some. It was beautiful blackness on screen, not just the visuals, but in the way we were represented. It was all black everything. With that said, take a listen to the sample of the audio description from Black Panther. Sophia? Okoye sits in meditation, facing a window in the huge jet. T'Challa sits beside Nakia, who holds his hand dotingly. Okoye gazes at the window. and approach a futuristic city of tall buildings. So for myself and other blind consumers, it was disruptive to have what sounds like a British white man narrate the AD for Black Panther. Now for the record, he sounds like a very nice guy. There's no shots to him at all. He and I could have a drink, but he's, dri uh, he's, he's gonna buy. He's gonna drive too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it took me out of Wakanda and dropped me in Wakanda. Like he literally said, Wakanda. Good AD takes all of this stuff into consideration and allows me as a blind person to approach the experience, approach it, the experience that sighted people get when they're watching it. Approach, because we're never going to be exactly, right? Good audio description needs the time to provide information. So if you notice in Black Panther, they had very little time during that scene. So they could only refer to the buildings in Wakanda as futuristic tall buildings, which doesn't really say much. I'm really happy. I've been on this soapbox for quite some times for what's known as pre-show in live theater for and ha having that used in films. And what that does is that it uses some time before the film to provide information about things like costume, setting, and even some of that indicative information about the characters. Especially noted if you think about sci-fi films where the description is so important because it's like nothing in our world, the things that we're seeing on that screen at that time. So my final story for you. Consider a time when you were gathered with family and friends, remember? We've all been in a similar situation where you're hanging out with people, a bunch of people, and someone says, hey, let's watch a movie. You go through a selection, you come to an agreement, and you watch the film. In the Reed family, here's what happens. One of my daughters or my wife would respond to that, hey, let's watch a movie question with something like, okay, but we need to find something with audio description. So now depending where we are, it could be followed by an explanation of what audio description is, where to find it, how to set it up. Then what happens is that we search and search and more than often I'm trying to convince my family to just go ahead and watch the movie. But now you see everybody's old enough, now they're grown and they feel real comfortable in telling me to be quiet because we're gonna watch something that you can enjoy too, daddy. Okay, cool. Every now and then we actually have to go ahead and watch the film. But what happens is that one of my ladies will come and sit next to me on the couch to make sure I'm included. Good audio description is about inclusion. It would eliminate the need for that final story. As in other cases involving accessibility, audio description, oh, that's my jaws, excuse me. <laughs> audio description goes, goes beyond just the intended audience, right? So if you think about closed captions, if you think about closed captions in sports bars, uh, if you remember what those are, <laughs> And you can also think about curb cuts, right? They're not just used by wheelchair users. While others do and should use AD, for those involved in making films and other visual content, thinking about and including AD in their production, preferably from the inception, can really enhance from an artistic standpoint. Um, this idea of letting scenes breathe, for example, that would actually give time for audio description. I think links are gonna be provided, but I just say, hey, I talk a lot more about audio description over at readmymind.com. And like I say on the podcast, that's spelled R-E-I-D, like my last name, 
Um, and there's a whole lot more to talk about on this, but thank you for the opportunity to talk to you all. Emily. So um, quickly, just a few final uh, um, takeaways, uh, but you know, we'll, we'll continue the conversation. Start somewhere. I know we've, we've worked with a lot of different institutions and done access consulting and found that people are so afraid of how far there is to go when you hear a presentation like this that can make it somewhat daunting that then the the unfortunate reality is they start nowhere. Um, you know, it, it doesn't, I know the reality with your budgets and the situation right now might be that you're not gonna have 100% of your film programming accessible over, overnight, but um, just start with like one, uh, two screenings, then work up to three, then work up to four and, and start putting it in your budget more and more. Um, well, I have this bit of light that I'm trying to run from, there we go. Um, Transparency is key. I have found that so many people, uh, the conversations we've said, we've had with pe people, they say, if people would just let us know that their festival isn't accessible, that would make us feel so much better about that festival, rather than sort of, you know, getting somebody on the phone who says, oh, I'm pretty sure we're accessible. And then they show up and then they, it's a ruined Saturday because it just wasn't an option at all. So just the, the very immediate short term, everyone should do is just throw something on your website that lets people know and be honest if you, if you aren't there yet. Uh, learn from mistakes. Um, boy, have I made them. Boy, has <laughs> Superfest made them. We continue to, but that's how we grow. And um, we just try to be as honest and open about those mistakes when we have them and use them as an opportunity to, to learn and, and, and talk about failure and, and failure is, is important. Um, and then lastly, reach out for help. Um, both Thomas, uh, yeah, as, as Thomas mentioned, his podcast is an amazing resource. Um, I can be reached uh, with my, my email, email is um, B-E-I-T-I-K-S at S-F-S-U, like San Francisco State University edu, or you can learn more about Superfest at superfestfilm.org. And Thomas's email is read my mind with R-E-I-D radio at gmail.com. So we'd love to have Jason come back on and join us. Thomas, come come back on too, and we'll get some of your questions. We've been looking at them, and they're they're really great. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, um, both to Thomas and Emily. That was a fantastic presentation, and uh, we're getting a lot of uh, comments in the chat and the um, Q and A that uh, say so. Um, I wanted to start here. So there's a question from Anna Fetter, which I think Emily, you were just kind of getting into a little bit about like you know, your kind of best practices, but this could be both towards you and Thomas. Anna writes, I would love to increase access on my series. I've been captioning features that don't have them and offering live captions for all conversations. Unfortunately, less than 10% of the films I screen have AD. How can we as exhibitors work to encourage, and then in parentheses, or even demand that all films we screen have captioning and AD available? Um, well, I can start by saying that, I mean, one of the things you're doing already is huge. You're asking for it because we often work with filmmakers who say that they have to like reach out to the film festival and say, Hey, I've got this audio described version. And they, they're like kind of aggressively putting it out there. And then the film festival sometimes doesn't know what to do with it or won't offer it. So, I mean, even just asking, because sometimes they're out there um, and, and, and film festivals don't even know that they have the ability to offer that. Um, but you know, you can start working towards taking a stance like Superfest does where we, we just won't, accept anything that doesn't have a plan. So people can apply to our festival without audio description and captioning, but they have to check a box on, we use Film Freeway like so many do, they have to check a box that says, if I'm accepted to the festival, I will work to get it captioned and audio described. Now, yes, unfortunately, tons of filmmakers check that box and they have no idea what that means. Uh, so then we work with them to uh, go the extra distance. And that, that means we have to do a lot of fundraising on our end to, to have grants available for filmmakers who just don't have it in the budget. But we have to really push because you know it is also very frustrating to have filmmakers say to us, well, the film is done, so we don't have that. And um, I'm quoting a, a colleague of Thomas and mine, Cheryl Green, who's an amazing audio describer and captioner. I recommend um, people uh, seek her out if you're looking for resources. 
she says, no, the film isn't done until you have these access features. We need to help um, film professionals start to think about it that way. Thomas, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, the only thing I was going to add is that, um, and, and it's the example is done by Superfest, like you guys do a great job in terms of really providing some of that information, some of that training. And so the more resources that we can get, and, you know, I would say whoever just send to these individual filmmakers to let them know what audio description is. And I think that's part of the first thing is that people don't understand what it means. And sometimes it sounds a lot more daunting than it is. So between learning what it is and then having a place where they can learn more about actually getting it done is a, is a great start. Thanks guys. This next question I think is still related. Um, to AD specifically. So Angela Lenhart writes, captions and AD work better with traditional films. How would you suggest negotiating content which has little to no dialogue? 25 minutes of uh, low humming sound is not interesting to many, period. Um, it varies a lot. You know, I actually find that, that silent films um, are much easier uh, than, than a lot because you, you just have silence. Audio description needs silence to, to do really rich um, audio description. So then we're working with the filmmaker to say, okay, but you need the best audio description writer and the best voice actor or voice actors to match the tone. And, and sometimes thinking outside the box about what it can be uh, so not aiming for direct translation, but actually thinking, well, there's a visceral experience that you're going to get when you're just watching all these visuals. How do you make the audio track sort of match that, that visceral feeling uh, is really important. Um, but, you know, that certainly what you, you pointed out is, is very accurate. You know, when we have foreign language films that are just so fast, it's really hard because access should be thought of before the film is even made. Um, and so you're just kind of trying to do the best that's possible. And that's where, you know, some of the strategies Thomas mentioned are so crucial, like, you know, and that's where that point as well about access is messy. You don't have a one size fits all approach. You have to look at each and every film and figure out what's going to be the best route here. Is it a really good pre-show? Is it that you're actually going to build in pauses to the film uh, the audio described version of the film to make some extra time throughout to sort of catch up and provide better audio description. Yeah, I've seen a, a, a great example of that artistic, Emily, I'm sure you're familiar with that because Cheryl is the one who told me about it, Song for Rent. And that was a really quirky film. It's a silent film, but the way they approached audio description totally added value. And from my understanding, you know, when it was when it was screened with sighted audience, it added value to the sighted audience as well. So it was they really went and totally left the box there and and just really um, did it. So I would say check out for an example if you want Song for Rent. It's a very quirky film, um, but what they did it was a silent film and the audio description really, from my understanding, gave me an equivalent experience to those who are sighted. So. It was, uh, it, it premiered at Superfest and um, they, fortunately it was a, a, a great example of like how the filmmakers should work with, you know, work on drafts and really think of this hard, you know, they sent the first draft and I got to review it. And I said, the film was super campy, queer campy film. And I said, you need to play that up even further. And, uh, and then the final version, the jurors were like, well, if we'd seen this version, I think we would have given it an award because that version just made it all come together. And, and something happened, which has happened many times at Superfest, which is that the filmmaker says that the audio described version of their film becomes their favorite version of the film. And, and so that filmmaker said he was only gonna play it with the audio description moving forward because he thought that it had enriched it so much. Um, I, I've worked with many filmmakers that say that like the process of having to audio describe makes them think about their art form in a completely new way. And um, they end up, they start thinking, oh, this is the stick, you know, this thing I have to do in order to screen at this high maintenance film festival. And then they end being like, wow, I will never make a movie the same way because of the process. Thanks for that. Um, so it's uh, 3.45 and we've been giving actually 10 more minutes of Q&A if both of you are willing and there's lots of questions. So is it cool if I keep on going? Okay, I'm on. Awesome. Sure. 
Um, there's a lot of questions in the chat about resources, like where to find um, different vendors and different uh, folks who can um, uh, provide these services. So um, I will let Emily and Thomas talk about that if they want to, but there's also a link in the chat that we put together before this that has a list of resources. So um, that might be able to capture some of these questions. Um, and then if I can actually keep Emily and Thomas the moment. Um, I think this is a really great question. So this comes from Claire Garrison and she's asking about resources for festivals to afford uh, accessibility um, technology or to offer it. So are there resources to help festivals afford technologies to make their screenings accessible, foundations or grants? Um, she says that several, several smaller fests I've worked with would love to provide assisted devices or ASL interpreters, but we're barely surviving even before COVID. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a really real part of this work, although, you know, some of the times um, I think access stuff can seem more expensive than it is in terms of like venue stuff and things like that. A lot of that is just playfulness and creativity with, with what the, you know, we often, we get into a venue and we're like, let us see your back storage rooms and we find things that work for us and, and make access possible. Um, but certainly, you know, ASL cart and audio description are, are some real hard costs that, that are, you know, one of the biggest challenges for our film festival to fundraise for as well, because there isn't a lot of funders that understand that and think about it. Um, the uh, NADC, the National, uh, I'll figure it out. Um, they're based down in UCLA. They have a uh, an access grant specifically. Um, SF Film has started to do really exciting work for their filmmaker grants where they um, help the filmmakers access is built into the funding. So that's great on the film filmmaker side of things. Um, but I think also we have had luck like with just our local arts institutions, um, you know, telling them this is something we want to do will you fund it and they're they're aware then that they're not thinking of it and that you know they aren't asking their all the arts organizations that they're funding to think about access so it can be something new and enticing you can bring to a funder that maybe in the past they're not funding you and that that they might fund you so um uh yeah, the, the costs are real and it's, it's part of it, but I think it just has to be thought of like you think of every other cost of your festival, the cost of, of doing business. Then I, I think, Emily, tell me if, if I'm correct, but I think Superfest sort of phased in accessibility in different ways. And what I mean by that is that I think at, at one point when blind consumers would be there, they were sort of gathered in one place and audio description was done in that area. So like, if you, if you couldn't do open audio description or something and you can't afford to have the transmitter and receiver, that type of thing, um, there's alter alternative ways, right? Would you, would mm -hmm. you, so. That's right. Just a live audio describer can run around 100 to 250 an hour, depending on who you find. And there, you know, you'd give them the film in advance so that they can prepare and they are just reading it and it truly can be just sequestered in a portion of the audience or you can, you know, there's a lot of ways you can just use a, a call in number and a zoom line to, to provide um, audio description without fancy headsets that requires, you know, having uh, smartphones, but um, yeah, that's a pretty low tech solution. Thank you. Um, one more on um, audio description. So this comes from Diara from Art, Art Matin Films. How do you handle AD for foreign language films? So those are the hardest ones we get probably. Well, foreign language and documentaries. Documentaries can be so hard because they do the, the box with the person's name and it's just talking head, talking head and they don't like a lot of silence. But foreign language can be the hardest. Um, what's essential is that you have multiple voice actors. Um, we have had films accepted to the festival that uh, they do the audio description themselves and they, you know, it'll, it'll be a film that we gave like the highest award to. And then when we see the audio described version, we're like, oh, that's a shame because they didn't come through to match the quality of the, the original version. If they have one actor who's like 
playing, you know, a little girl and then a mom. And then a, it's just, it, it's not, it's going to be an example of compliance, but not quality. Um, so we ask our foreign language films to use multiple voice actors. And then again, extra time if necessary, a pre-show, but it's, it's some of the hardest to do. And just so then again, that's where transparency comes in. We're also pretty honest with folks when they reach out like, oh, if you're a blind viewer, we've this screening is gonna be better. Like these are the better audio described films that like, do, you know, just are the best for, for showcasing audio description. And these other ones are audio described and we'd love to have you there. They're not as great as, um, as they could be. I was going to say though for for folks who are looking for an example i mean you you have it right there for those who you know subscribe to netflix or even amazon you can go into a foreign film um if it if it has audio description attached or you know whatever and and just pull it down usually it's within the language selection if you go to the language selection of that film and look for english audio description you'll you'll have a bunch of examples and they're usually telling you at the end of the film um, who actually created the audio description for that that particular track what one more thing to add to is that this is a really great example of the competing accommodations that come up so um, we had this amazing audio description film that came from Kazakhstan and it was a the whole film was primarily this one actor who had CP. And, you know, when we were working with the audio description company, they really just wanted a pure dub. And we were like, well, if you dub, you know, we're going to hear this voice actor, uh, but we're not going to hear the disabled man's voice and his, you know, his disability accent with CP. And we're like, that's really, uh, we're getting access, but we've lost hearing this disabled person's voice. Um, so, you know, we really worked with them to make sure that the sound levels were such that you, there was a audio revoicing, um, but it wasn't, you could still hear the way his intonation was in the background. So sound levels are, are so crucial and having an audio description company looking for top quality, like what Thomas is mentioning, where they'll, they'll think about that is crucial. Thank you both. Okay, so we have about two minutes left. I'm going to, um, in the Q&A section and just uh, move into closing the session out. I did want to mention one person, uh, Emily and Thomas, that you might want to connect with somehow is Megan Mitchell. Um, Megan's been writing a few notes in here and it looks like they are part of, um, they're a UK based exhibitor that runs a festival that requires um, AD and full on, on every film. And I just wanted to read this for everybody because I think this is really interesting. And in some ways like this kind of collective action that somebody like the FFA could, could potentially help with. So uh, Megan writes, a suggestion for captions slash AD access. In the UK, Matchbox cinemas are working uh, to create a resource with BFI to host a database of caption files produced by festivals funded by public money, meaning they're free to use for other fest, fests too. Perhaps the US could collectively do the same. And then, and, wow. then Anna wrote, and then Anna wrote, except we have very little public money for anything in the US. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like that's an interesting, I had never heard about that. I just wanted to mention that. No, that's awesome. That actually brings up a whole nother topic when it comes to audio yeah. description and, and sharing the, uh, the AD tracks between vendors who are actually, you know, streamers and stuff. So yeah, that's a, that sounds great. All right. Maybe we can point people towards your podcast to, for, a, for a <laughs> upset on that, Thomas. Absolutely. All right, well, I want to just thank Emily Vitex and Thomas Reed for sharing their insight and lived experiences. Thank you both. Um, you've probably noticed by now that we are doing our best to model a fully accessible Zoom presentation. And I want to take a moment to thank all of our, our vendors for that because it, 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 it does take a few folks. Um, on ASL interpretation, we have Selena Flowers and Benjamin Smith from Pro Bono ASL out of San Francisco. They are a great company to work with if anybody's looking for um, ASL interpretation. Uh, with live captioning and, and StreamYard, we have, um, sorry, stream text. We have Tina Dillon of Dillon Reporting Services from Illinois. Thank you, Tina. On the back end of the Zoom call, we have um, a few folks from, from Full Spectrum and the FFA. We have Sophia um, Valela, who's the producer, Brian uh, Khan and Georgia Bernstein, who are helping to support the call. And there's also somebody um, from the FFA, Caitlin, who's been helping us with the Q&A. 
So I want to finally thank um, all of you for attending and for being engaged and for asking great questions. And I want to also thank everybody at the FFA for, um, I think, you know, just centering this really important conversation. So thank you all for joining and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>